Okay, so this is MitoHacker podcast, and my guest is Professor Ben Mickman. And first of all, it's such a big honor to have you on the on the podcast. And oh, thank Peter, you for my, saying my yes. pleasure. My pleasure. Happy to be here and happy to talk about uh, anything metabolism. Thanks for the invitation. And, and, and your background is, as I remember, um, a biogenesis, right? That was your PhD, right? Yeah, yeah, bioenergetics. Oh, bio, okay, all right. So even better. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and basically, anybody who wants to know anything about insulin today, it seems like they turn to you. Is that, do you feel like that? Well, well that's, a, that's a generous way of describing it. Yes, I, I study as a scientist, I really have focused on um, insulin resistance and, and how, I guess if I were to describe it another way, it is uh, a career that has, is partly based on looking at the, the pathogenic side of the hormone insulin. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, Emphas uh, exploring the ways in which insulin is harming the body, uh, and, and that happens when insulin is too high mm -hmm. for too long. Uh, you know, we typically just look at insulin, and very correctly, but we look at it as a hormone that is is good and needed, and that is mm -hmm. true. But there's a there's a, a dark side to it. It has a villainous side as well, and that's what much of my career is is focused on. Mm -hmm. And when we are talking about a hormone, we're always talking about another hormone. So, so basically they, they usually come in pairs in, yeah, that's in, in true. case one of them is too active, the other is helping to push it down or something like that. So, but I agree with that. In many cases, we hear about insulin as the villain, while it does have a lot of very important role, right? But as I understand today, uh, lifestyle and uh, food, it basically brings out the worst from insulin, right? So yeah, what, what oh, that's, is the worst? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if, if we look at insulin <clears throat> and its villainous um, side, uh, it, it is really uh, when insulin is too high for too long. And that happens when someone is eating very frequently which we are told to do, you know, we are told six small meals a day is the way to go. And so that's one piece of terrible advice, but we combine that with another piece of terrible advice, which is, and your diet should be 60% or more of carbohydrates. And that should be grains and cereals and things like that. And those are the foods that increase insulin the most. And so we are not only, we are eating them, all the time, six times a day or, or more if we include little starchy, sugary snacks. Um, and we're eating the foods that spike insulin. So tragically, if we look at that um, through a 24 hour time frame, someone wakes up in the morning and their insulin is finally, finally low because they have not eaten in the night, hopefully. So insulin has been coming down over the night and they wake up and insulin is low. And that is the end because they eat a starchy, sugary breakfast, especially here in the US and Canada. It's, it, it, uh, they spike up the insulin, and then right as insulin starts to come down, and it can spike up more than 10 times higher than normal levels, and it can stay elevated just from that one meal, it can stay elevated for up to four hours if the person is a little insulin resistant. But let's just keep going with it. It spikes up for breakfast. It just starts to come down. Then they eat a mid-morning snack of starches and sugars. Oh, it comes back up. And then it starts to come down. Then they eat lunch. And then afternoon snack. Then dinner. And then evening snack. Every waking moment is spent in a state of elevated insulin. And too much of something in the body will cause a resistance to that something. And so you start to have that chronic increase in insulin is part of what can go into someone developing insulin resistance. It's not the only factor, but insulin alone can cause insulin resistance. We found this in my lab in, in animal models. If uh, in other people have published other studies in humans and muscle cells and fat cells, too much insulin will cause insulin resistance. Okay, so what would be the plan B? So let's say a person wakes up the insulin is low naturally because the person didn't eat food for let's say eight, nine hours or more. Yep. And what would be the best idea? So continue the, the, the fasting option one, mm -hmm. uh, breaking with something uh, less insulin magic, which yep. create, right. Or the third yep. one may be training even, right? So which is your choice or which do you prefer? 
Yeah, so those are all great. In fact, I'll just elaborate just to repeat them. Yes, so if you fast through breakfast, uh, a true food fast, you don't eat anything, absolutely, that is going to be the best way to keep insulin low. But a fast has to end at some point. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so what would you eat when you're ending your fast? As you say, another way to do it is to avoid the most insulinogenic foods, so avoid starches and sugars. And that means focusing on protein and fat. Fat has, has little to no effect on insulin. Protein will have a bigger effect, but there are some variables there um, that can influence how much insulin will climb. But nevertheless, focus on those two. That's a good way to do it. Or training is an interesting one because during the training itself, insulin will be very low. <clears throat> Uh, after the training, insulin can climb a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but then come back down. But what happens during training, it, but that's not bad. Despite the fact that insulin will come up a bit, that's not a bad thing at all. Um, it's meant to happen. So I wouldn't want someone to not train because they're afraid of a little insulin bump at the end of it. No, uh, that, that it's negligible. Uh, but training ends up increasing the demand for glucose. So it's a very good way to really pull the glucose from the blood and, and push insulin down because uh, yeah, insulin will go down the moment exercise starts and insulin antagonist hormones um, like epinephrine or cortisol will go up during exercise and they directly combat what insulin is, would want mm -hmm. to do. These cortisol and epinephrine want to flush the body with glucose so the muscles can greedily pull it in. And so we don't want, those hormones aren't supposed to be both high. You know, you don't want epinephrine high and insulin. So during exercise, epinephrine wins that battle and, and, and insulin comes down. Also, um, one of the thing is hunger, right? So, uh, which is, in one way, it's, um, it's a learned behavior, I mm -hmm. think mm -hmm. the other is, of course, hunger is hunger. But is is that possible that ep epinephrine could uh, modulate hunger? So basically, if I m now hungry, but I want to have, let's say, in a cal caloric deficit, then mm -hmm. I I should move a little bit so epinephrine goes up, and then maybe my hunger will come back later, but at least not right now. Yeah, that's a great question, Peter. I am unaware of any evidence linking epinephrine to hunger. I don't know. I, I don't know how linked they are. Um, but I, so I can't speak to that. I wish mm -hmm. I could. But, but I do like how you distinguished two phases. I, um, I refer to two phases of hunger where one is uh, I wish I had a clever name, but sort of the the hedonistic, the the I just want to eat because I'm used to something being in my stomach, mm -hmm. and and so when food has passed through the intestines, after it's passed through, you can feel hungry, and this is typically around 16 or so hours, 16 to 20 hours. If someone started a fast around that time, 16 hours, they'd start to feel hungry. That's just because the intestines had been full now they're empty mm -hmm. and you just feel that sort of emptiness a little bit mm -hmm. uh, and so you feel a little hungry that passes uh, qu quite quickly and my suggestion when someone is fe are feeling that it is drink more and even drink um, so, um, some electrolytes with with your water uh, that's a good way to help that to get over that quickly and then the person once they get through that short hunger they really won't feel too hungry again for, mm -hmm. for potentially days. Uh, and the next stage of, I guess, obvious hunger is when you actually start to run out of, of fat. Uh, and, and that can happen. Uh, you know, you're a lean man. If you did a, a seven week fast, a seven day fast, seven day, you would start to, not that I'm advocating that, that's a long time, but you would start to run out of fat. I'm a lean man. At seven days, I'm going to start running out of fat. And then the fear then, when you start to run out of fat, you have a substantial hunger that you're willing to eat even another human body. You know, your hunger is, is just to the point of um, un uh, you cannot deal with it anymore. But that point comes when you have run out of fat and now you're losing muscle. That is a point of, of true starvation. When you've run out of fat and now you're cutting into your muscle to take your muscle protein and move it to the liver for the liver to turn it into new glucose, that is starvation. But fat tissue 
and the ketones that are produced from that burning that fat, it protects the muscle from being burned. And so that's why we say ketones are muscle sparing. It's because if the brain can use ketones, it doesn't need so much glucose and it can allow the protein to stay in the muscle. But those ketones come from body fat. And once body fat starts to run down, now we have to start relying on the muscle. So we start cutting our muscle or our lean tissue. And now that's starvation. And now the person has a hunger that is insatiable. They, they are going to satisfy that any way they can. Before uh, the, the body would see uh, fat as a fuel, right? It, it, it has to be um, switched to that uh, pathway. So mm -hmm. isn't that a problem that most people are uh, not, most people are not seeing or they central nervous system or whatever is not seeing the fat deposits as a valuable fuel. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. So the body can't use its own fat for fuel unless insulin is low. Only when insulin is low can the body switch to fat burning. So human metabolism is kind of like a hybrid engine where mm -hmm. it can use gasoline or electricity in the human metabolism. It can use glucose or fat. Those are the main fuels. Mm -hmm. Now there are other ones like ketones is a fuel, no doubt. Even lactate mm -hmm. from uh, the body is, can be used a few, uh, as a fuel, but those are much more modest. It's, it's fat and it's glucose. And so at any moment, the person is burning uh, different levels of those energy sources and insulin is what dictates which energy. If insulin is high, the body is in glucose burning mode. Mm -hmm. If insulin is low, then the body is in fat burning mode. And that's so important because as you say, with regards to body fat, the body won't be able to use it unless insulin is low. So here in, in, the, Ute, in the state of Utah, in the US, there's lots of beautiful mountains and people always go hiking in the mountains. And I will see very overweight people with, with energy bars, you know, granola bars or sure. Gatorade drink, energy drinks, and, and, and they, they need energy. And that's so wrong. Their body is covered with energy. You know, yeah. ev anywhere where someone has more fat on their belly and it's like they have a bunch of energy bars and, and Gatorade bottles strapped across their belly. You know, they, so we have energy bars but they're just waiting to be used. We just have to get our insulin down. Now our body can, you know, so-called open those energy bars and actually use the energy. But if insulin is high, then it may as well not even be there. We can't touch it uh, because we're in sugar burning mode, not fat burning. But isn't that a problem that, I mean, we don't have many macros if you think about, like we have three options mainly. So if, if and when fat and protein getting vilified, Mm. Yeah, I mean, the yeah. rest is only carbohydrates. So. That's right. Then you, and, and what's tragic about that, Peter, is that fat and protein are the two essential macronutrients. Mm -hmm. There's nothing essential about carbohydrates. And I'm not saying don't eat them, but I am saying how unfortunate. Not only does it increase insulin the most, but it's also the one macronutrient that we don't need. And now it's become the foundation of diet, because like you say, people want to vilify fats, people want to vilify, pro especially animal proteins, which we should talk about that more, animal proteins versus plant proteins. But they, they, they want to think these are bad, they're gonna make you die of cancer and, and heart disease, so don't eat those. Well, then all you have left is the one thing you don't need, and that's carbohydrates. So it's a terrible way of looking at human nutrition. It's terrible. And when, when we say uh, you don't need, that doesn't mean your body doesn't need, it's just you don't yeah. need to eat it, right? So because yeah, that's your right. body yeah. can create it if, if it's needed. Am, that's right. right. Yeah, that, that's why you don't need it in the diet. You don't mm -hmm. need carbohydrates mm -hmm. in the diet. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, let me, be, let me make sure I'm clear. Dietary carbohydrates are not essential. Now, mm -hmm. some people will mistake that for me saying, oh, Dr. Bickman's saying that glucose isn't essential. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. It's, it's dietary carbohydrates are not essential because the body can make the glucose mm -hmm. that it needs. Mm -hmm. In fact, I mentioned lactate a moment ago. When someone's fasting, lactate is actually the main source of glucose that the liver will use. The, the working muscle or red blood cells yeah. will pump out lactate, and then the liver will pull in the lactate and spit out glucose. So it's a brilliant system of recycling.
So, so basically, you know, lactate was seen for, I don't know, for like 50 years or more. Oh, decades, decades, absolutely. Decades, okay. As definitely a, a, a waste product, mm -hmm. something that only causing death and, and muscle soreness and, um, yep. right? And, yeah, yeah. And around the and none of that's true. None of yeah, that's true. Yeah, and around the 1980s, so basically 50 years ago, I believe, uh, uh, Brooks, right? So he, mm -hmm. Oh, he yes, yeah, George Brooks yeah, at, at, the, uh, the he, um, Shuttle, in California. Uh, yeah, so, so basically what you're saying, let's say somebody goes into low carb. Mm -hmm. It can be even on some degree of ketosis, right? Yep. So what are you saying that suddenly other... Uh, uh, let's say food sources, energy bits start to play uh, a very strong role and lactate is one of them. Uh, definitely uh, fat, which is triglyceride are another one. Ketones mm -hmm. are there. And if it's needed, we can g uh, definitely create glucose if it's needed, right? Yep. yep. And we right? need glucose, like mm -hmm. uh, red blood cells. Sure. Definitely red blood cells in the blood absolutely use glucose for fuel uh, because they have no mitochondria mm -hmm. and glucose is the only fuel that can be burned outside of the mitochondria whereas ketone lactate fatty acid they have to be used in the mitochondria yeah. and so the red blood cells for example and, and other cells possibly to varying degrees must have glucose and so we have to have it but the body can make it which is pretty amazing what you said that that the red blood cell doesn't have mitochondria, but it carries the oxygen. It's, it's that's mind true. Blowing. That's true. Right? Yeah, yeah, you're it's right. That's an excellent blowing. point. It doesn't need the oxygen, but it takes it around. In, in fact, maybe that's why. Because it doesn't have its own mitochondria, it can't use the oxygen. It just carries it yeah. to someone else. Because if it could use it, then it would eat it all up. Yeah. In the, in, you know, by the time it came from lung to muscle, oops, it would get to the muscle and say, oh, sorry, I didn't leave any for you. I already used it. Yeah. Somebody said very wisely that, you know, the reason is that uh, it's a bad idea to give the same person the match and the dynamite. Yeah, that's right. And I think that was pretty cool. That's a clever way of saying it. Yeah. So, so, so you say, uh, let's talk about protein because it was definitely on my list because it's another thing that's getting vilified. I mean, I mean, first of all, in ketogenic diet, which I'm, I'm playing with uh, keto diet for about seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. And early on, I was really, you know, uh, shocked that it was always told that you have to go really low with protein, make yeah. it the mTOR, and yeah. you'll get all kind of nasty cancers. And yep. if possible, also switch to plant protein. Yeah. Because that's definitely lower in leucine and whatever. So, mm -hmm. what is your point on that? Uh, very, yeah. Where is the minimum protein you would recommend? Let's say. Yeah. I mean, that, another Canadian uh, already said the rules, right? Yeah, yeah, one. yeah. Stu Phillips. In fact, exactly. I just, I, I will just defer to him and repeat what he said. Oh, okay. Um, but, but yeah, let's, let's, let's get into that. So, first of all, the recommendation is based on Dr. Stuart Phillips at McMaster University, and I, I sort of loosely paraphrase him, but it's roughly one to one and a half grams of protein per kilogram body mm -hmm. mass. Now, if mm -hmm. someone's very overweight. Uh, then they have, then that would be too much. And so in that case, if they know that they are 40 kilos overweight, well then go to base that off of your ideal body weight. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, it's one to one and a half grams per kilogram. And the older we get, the higher that we need to be on that. Because as Dr. Phillips identified, people as they get older have uh, their ability to convert dietary protein into muscle or bone protein becomes diminished. And so we actually need a little more in our diets. So if someone's mm -hmm. listening to this and they're older and a little active, even if they're not active, you need more protein than you think. So make sure you're getting it. And then, then we, so once, so just looking at an amount is one thing, then we have to look at the quantity, then we look at quality. Mm -hmm. And anyone who says plant protein is better is lying. They are absolute lying. There is no debate. Animal protein is superior in every way. Now, if someone has ethical reasons, you know, they say, I don't want to consume, um, maybe, maybe religious or, or sure. moral, whatever. Well, okay, so be it. Uh, then they have to do what they have to do. 
But if someone is consuming plant protein because they think it's better for them, that's completely wrong. So we know that um, animal protein has not only a full range of amino acids that we need, um, but also we use it better. The actual ability of the body to pull that protein from the intestines into the blood as amino acids is, is much, much better. But also one thing that people don't, and that's all measurable. We've, we've, mm -hmm. That's been published for decades. We know that we evolved on eating animal protein. In fact, and so that kind of gets to my next point about plant protein. <clears throat> Plants don't really have a lot of protein. They have a minuscule amount of protein. So one of the popular proteins right now is uh, pea from peas, mm -hmm. little green peas. And peas have an, a minuscule amount of protein. So in order to get enough protein to have a, a serving of protein, you have to take a, a thousand peas, you know, a thousand peas and you get a little bit of protein. <clears throat> so you concentrate and concentrate and concentrate the protein to get enough for one serving, one scoop of, of pea protein. That's what you want to concentrate. Unfortunately, as you are getting all that protein from all those peas, you also start concentrating heavy metals like lead and arsenic. Mm -hmm. And this has been quantified where many of these plant proteins have dangerously high levels of lead and arsenic. And these are metals that stay in the body for a very long time. Mm -hmm. we, we know that they can be lethal. So, so don't, don't get that. The nice thing about animal proteins one, the animal has actually filtered out those molecules like an organism does and like, a, like an animal will do. And two, you don't have to concentrate anything. It's just the pure whey or it's just the egg white, which are the two best proteins. There's no concentrating required. And so that's why those have the lowest levels. The animal proteins have the lowest levels of lead and arsenic. Now, part of the fear of protein is, as you say, it's going to give cancer and it's going to age you faster. Mm -hmm. My frustration with that perspective is that the main um, scientist that is, that is teaching that idea and sharing that idea, his own data challenge it. So when, they, when this scientist looked at people as they age, when the people get to 65 years old, I think that was the cutoff, the 65 year olds and older that eat, ate the least amount of protein were the ones that had the highest mortality. They died mm -hmm. faster. Mm -hmm. In contrast, just to say it equally, the 65 year olds and older that ate the most protein lived the longest. Mm -hmm. That right there shoots the whole idea down. If you want to age well, eat protein. So are we talking That's, about, uh, I'm sorry, are we talking about Walter Longo's? Uh, yes, I am. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just wanted I'm to sorry. be a little diplomatic. I, I've uh, met him and he's perfectly nice, sure. but I, I, I very much disagree with his perspective. Sure. He published a paper that, that, you know, between an age group of like 35 to 65, people ate more protein and died more. But then, but then when you get to 65 and older, then it, you didn't. And so if the whole idea is that it helps with aging and longevity. Well, then shouldn't the oldest people be the most adversely affected? And they weren't. They they needed to eat more protein to live well. So that idea is is a bit silly to me. Um, but I do I do try to say that with respect because I think sure. he's in generally a good scientist. I just don't agree with his conclusions, um, and that's okay. We can disagree in science um, very respectfully. So yeah, my thought is eat animal protein. This is a protein that we have we have evolved on with without any doubt we know that our ancestors ate protein uh, and so we should too from animal mm -hmm. sources now interestingly mm -hmm. peter nature uh in nature protein comes with fat that's what i wanted to ask yes you don't yeah you don't and, and the plant proteins are an exception it's because plant proteins don't really have protein the, the amount of protein you get from a plant is negligible you have to concentrate and concentrate mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. concentrate it. So our ancestors would have never attempted to get protein from plants because that's silly. Uh, plants came from, an, uh, protein came from animals and it always comes with fat. Those two macronutrients are built to come together and that's why they, I believe they do in nature. And but, interestingly, Peter, for you as an athlete and even me as a middle-aged man who wants to keep my muscle, um, this has been studied uh, where, I think it might have even been Stu Phillips, uh, the guy I just mentioned. 
if you give um, athletes protein alone, you get a certain amount of muscle mm -hmm. synthesis mm -hmm. protein, muscle protein synthesis. If you give them mus uh, protein and fat together, it works even better. The, the amount of protein synthesis at the muscle is higher than it is from protein alone. So there's just something kind of magic about fat and protein coming together. Are you trying to sell the eggs? I, I, in fact, I think eggs are, are God's most perfectly packaged food. I agree. It comes in this one to one ratio of fats to protein by mass. If you weighed them, you know, by mass, there's as much fat as there is protein. I consider that, I like to joke, that's a divine ratio. I think God put the perfect amount in that one little egg and, and that is the perfect food. And once upon a time, Peter, especially in the US, we didn't really eat chickens. You know, chicken meat mm -hmm. used to be almost unheard of in our diet. It was very, very little. And now it's one of the most common meats, in fact, probably the most common meat. But we used to just keep chickens for the eggs. We didn't eat the chicken. We ate the eggs. Sure. And, and so and anyway, yeah, I think an egg is the perfect food. Now, now, what about the other guys, which is when, uh, which is today it's happening, when fat, wh whatever type of fat, but fat comes with carbohydrate. Because this yeah. is what we do today, right? Which is completely is. opposite what you say. And as much as I understand, that somehow changes the environment in the brain. Yeah, yeah. So fat and carbohydrate together is, I guess, if I said fat and protein is a divine mix, a godly mix, then, then fat and carbohydrate is a, is a devilish mix. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the evil version of food, if you will. Mm -hmm. I'm being a little silly, but you, you understand. Yeah, in nature... Fat and, and, and starch is very rare. Now, you can have fat and fiber, like an avocado or a coconut or even an olive, but those have very little you know, starch, like digestible glucose spiking starches. It's fiber. Um, so fat doesn't typically go with carbohydrate. I mean, as carbohydrate just often comes on its own. You know, when you eat an apple or, or a banana um, or just straight wheat, you know, if you were just chewing on wheat or rice, uh, that's just carbohydrate with minuscule amounts of fat and protein. It's what we've done to change it. We take, we take the carbohydrate and then we mix it with fat. And now we have a delicious loaf of bread or we have some pastry or we have um, some, some, some treat, you know, some, some cake or something uh, that is, doesn't exist in nature. And there's something deeply rewarding so satisfying the sweet um and the and the and the creamy oh that's it's it's a drug and, and not just that but but we're mixing diverse kind of fat and a diverse kind of carbohydrate right so yeah because our fear from uh, saturated fats making us to use something completely something, different something worse yes yeah. yeah so so that that's right that's another change where um, once upon a time, the most common, like in the U.S., there's some very neat um, data available uh, through a scientist who works at the National Institutes of Health at the NIH. He looked at and quantified to the best of his ability the fats that we eat. And the most common fats used to be animal fats, like, like beef and pork. Mm -hmm. Now those are Pork is less. We eat less pork now in the U.S. than we did 100 years ago. We eat about the same amount of beef. It's gone up and down. But you look at one thing that went from nothing to the most common, and that was soybean oil. Soybean oil went from zero. We didn't eat any of it 100 years ago. And now it's the most common fat in the Western diet because if someone is eating a processed food, it's almost guaranteed the fat is from soybean oil. And soybean oil um, like these refined seed oils, is very high in, in, in what's called an omega-6 polyunsaturated fat. And that is also a fat that is, um, becomes uh, very, like uh, it turns into a very harmful molecule in the body and, and hurts the body in very real ways, uh, like uh, atherosclerosis, fatty liver disease, potentially even cancer. So we fear, we, we fear saturated fat, and yet that's a fact that once again, we, our species has been eating for thousands, thousands, thousands of years. It was our evolutionary food to eat saturated fats from animals and those proteins together. 
And one of the interesting stuff that what you are talking about, and definitely Dr. Uh, David Ludwig is talking about, is on low carb diet, somehow we use more energy. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. Yes. But on the other hand, on higher insulin, we kind of saving energy. Right. Yep, that's exactly right. And yeah. The, in fact, and the the difference, as I understand, it's remarkable. So we are not talking about like a few kilocalories here and there, but no. something remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yep. There are. Uh, in fact, I'm just about to um, publish my study that touches on this, but I'll get to that in a moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, David Ludwig found that if you give someone, if you switch their diets up, that when they were eating the highest carbohydrate diet, then their metabolic rate slowed by about 100 calories per day. Mm -hmm. If you gave them the lowest carbohydrate, highest fat, then the metabolic rate went up about 150 calories a day. Mm -hmm. And so that's not inconsequential, like you say. So the difference, 250, actually, I think it was a little more, 250 calorie, uh, calorie kilocalories per day difference. That is, that's like, a, that's, you know, running for, for uh, 45 minutes or so, or an hour to burn mm -hmm. that many calories. Or you just eat low carb. Uh, and, and other studies have shown this too where a, a, another study, a scientist who's very anti-keto diet, um, for some reason, he, he published a paper finding that when people were in ketosis, just ketosis, uh, it, and they used a different way of measuring this. They were in a metabolic ward, so in a little metabolic mm -hmm. chamber. Um, they found that metabolic rate was about 80 calories per day higher, but it, it was less, but it was still significant. So not a chance, not a random event. It was still statistically significant. So we have multiple data um, indicating that if your insulin is low, your metabolic rate is higher. Oh, and Peter, we can see this even in people with type 1 diabetes. <clears throat> if you take a type 1 diabetic who's not giving themselves their insulin, their metabolic rate is about 200 calories per day higher than it should be and you mm -hmm. give them insulin and immediately the moment you give them insulin you can see the metabolic rate start to drop immediately minute to minute to minute this starts to go down and that is the reason they can go super skinny unfortunately right that's right but, yeah yeah mm -hmm. because if you don't have insulin you can't store energy mm -hmm. it, it, the fat cells won't pull any energy and your metabolic rate is really high and when insulin comes up well now the body starts conserving energy metabolic rate goes down and it starts pushing energy into fat cells to make them bigger. Now, so, one more. Yeah. I'm sorry, well, my, let me just say my data from my study, from my laboratory that we're just about to publish, we found that uh, in, uh, ketones actually stimulate metabolic rate in fat cells. So mm -hmm. it, within the fat cell itself. So we actually had human volunteers come into my lab and some were in ketosis, so very high ketones, low insulin, and some were not, so higher insulin, low ketones. And we, we pulled a little piece of fat from the fat tissue right beside their belly button. Mm -hmm. So we made a teeny little incision, pulled out a piece of fat, and then we went and measured the metabolic rate of that fat. And when people were in ketosis, their metabolic rate of their fat tissue itself was about two or three times higher than when they were not in ketosis. So, so you, you measured like white adipose tissue, right? Yeah, yeah that's uh -huh. right. And so the white adipose starts to act like brown adipose. Mm -hmm. And people have seen this before. We're not the first to show that. It, uh, but we are showing that the ketones can help flip that switch where white fat is very low metabolic rate. It just stores energy. And then brown fat, which we have a little bit of, all humans have a little bit around their, mm -hmm. their thoracic cavity, around the ribs, but around the neck and, and the mm -hmm. clavicle, the collar area. We all have a little bit. And brown fat is brown because it has a lot of mitochondria. Mm -hmm. And these mitochondria just chew through energy to make heat. So very high metabolic rate. Well, that what we found is that the ketones help turn this white fat that we have that we can pinch on our body it turns the white fat to start acting more like brown fat. So, but, but to make sure that we have ketones, whatever amount of ketones in mm -hmm. the body, uh, insulin has to be regulated and low, right? So in that case, another hormone can jump in, right? So is that glucagon? 
Yeah, so glucagon can stimulate. This is a bit of conflicting evidence, but it, it mm -hmm. appears that glucagon can stimulate lipolysis at the fat cell and stimulate ketogenesis in the liver. So it's helping both of those processes. So yeah, ins uh, glucagon is, is really kind of insulin's, well, there are several. Insulin is so good at doing what it does that it, there are several hormones that counter what insulin does. And I mentioned mm -hmm. two earlier, epinephrine and, and, and cortisol, and glucagon is another one. In fact, glucagon is kind of the main opposite, that if we say insulin is the hormone of feeding, if you eat, insulin is the hormone that, that just really tells the body, I am in a fed state, I have eaten. In contrast, if you're in a fasted state, then glucagon is the hormone of the fasted state. Mm -hmm. And that is basically saying, I'm not eating, I need to move my energy uh, around to be used by the body, not store it, but use it. Mm -hmm. Glucagon is that hormone. And what of the reason people like to eat um, at the end of the training, um, higher carb and, and protein, because it was told uh, that the insulin, which is released by the high carb intake, it will help to, to uh, yep. move in protein and of course amino acids. So it will be a higher effect on, on muscle building. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and that's not true. Uh, once again, mm -hmm. I, I will invoke Stuart Phillips um, from Eastern Canada. Um, I got to make sure he listens to this podcast so we can see how much love he's getting here. <laughs> but he he did this study where he looked at uh, giving athletes um, people exercising just protein, and then the other group they got protein and carbohydrate, and it did not amplify the protein at all. It was no better than the protein itself. So. That, that idea of, okay, after my workout, I need to get in my glucose and my protein in a, in a window of time. No, that does not appear to be true. Just make sure you get enough protein in a day and you're good. Are you using like a BCA or leucine or something Me? like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I like to, um, real food is best, you know, meat and eggs, focus on meat and eggs to get protein. I will, um, when I make a little, um, a little workout drink, I will put a little bit of ketone salts and then one, about one gram of, of leucine mm -hmm. as well. So leucine is the main amino acid that we need. And then I'll just mention this. Um, people that are in the U.S. at least, Peter, if they're curious, with a couple of my brothers, we made a kind of a version of a protein shake mm -hmm. um, called Complete Meal, but it's not just protein. It, 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 it's built on this idea of protein works better when it comes with fat mm -hmm. in a one-to-one -one balance. And so that's mm -hmm. how we designed it with, with whey and egg white, the best animal fats, and then with fruit fats, coconut, avocado, uh, coconut and olive mostly, but a little bit of ghee, grass-fed ghee as well. So the clarified butter. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, Protein and fat work better in a one-to-one. -one. And so that is my main sources for me personally. I will eat meat and eggs um, very liberally. Um, I will typically get a protein shake, partly because mm -hmm. it's so convenient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I like shakes. Some people don't like shakes. I like shakes. I enjoy taking protein shakes. Maybe it's just because I kind of have been an athlete for most of my life and there's just something... I just think I'm like Arnold Schwarzenegger if I'm drinking it, you know. Um, and, and then and I also, like I say, I take a little bit of leucine uh, every day um, right before my workout because it takes leucine about 45 minutes to get into the blood. And, and although there's no evidence to show that that is necessary, I usually just take it right before I work out. So uh, you mentioned you eat mainly um, uh, animal-based uh, Yeah. And all I want to mention when you were talking about, about uh, you know, sickness or the other uh, case is getting older, that whenever I'm looking at people who are following a carnivore diet, they look, um, they look amazing. I totally agree. Right? I, I, they do. And I, I often sort of joke that the people who I know, that, that I know here, even in my neighborhood, in mm -hmm. my community that adhere to a carnivore diet, they are some of the fittest most just robust men and women uh, that I ever have met. Uh, and then in contrast, people who don't eat any animal food, they don't look so good. 
So, so one thing, you know, I, uh, I had this question before that when we uh, see high carb and low carb uh, data, and mm -hmm. we see like, uh, it can be right, uh, isocaloric, right? Yeah. Uh, it should be for a, for a uh, uh, science Yeah, for a good uh, study, process. yeah. So at that point, do we see that? And, and this is like a longer question. Uh, this is my, comes from experience. So sometimes I see people go on ketogenic diet, right? And even though they're on, the, on a very low carb end of the story. And what I see that, you know, they're suffering and losing uh, even muscle and, and body fat, of course. And it, could that be because unwillingly they are in minus 275 calories, even though they are on isocaloric diet? Yeah, that could be. So I think, um, yeah, I'd say that's very possible. Anytime you start calorie restricting, you do run the risk of just losing mass from everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so if someone is is calorie restricting, I would say you've got to make sure you're getting enough protein. Um, and then once again, I say that fat helps protein work better, but of course, fat is higher calorie. So, so I am actually, I'm not an advocate of deliberate calorie restricting, but when someone goes onto a ketogenic diet, they may just start eating less um, because they're just not as hungry. That is, I think, one of the strengths of a ketogenic diet. You just regulate your appetite mm -hmm. better. Uh, but they mu they should be combining that with some resistance training. That does not mean they have to be doing deadlifts or squats with a barbell. No, I don't. I only do body weight based exercises and, and it does not need to be extreme. Once again, Dr. Stuart Phillips showed that uh, if you have people that just go, as long as they go to failure, that's the most important for maintaining muscle mass or, or even building it even as we are old. So if someone's doing a lighter load and going to 30 repetitions or someone's doing higher mass, heavier load and going fewer repetitions, as long as they go to failure, then the muscle protein um, creation, the muscle growth is the same. So just go, my advice to anyone listening, if they want to go to a low carb diet or any diet, uh, make sure you are doing some resistance training and that you go to failure um, on those sets. That's more important than the number. Many times the, the critics of the low carb or uh, ketogenic diet, they say, especially for women, that uh, they're going to have issues with uh, the thyroid. So they're going to be hypothyroid issues there. Is that possible? The reason is because they go very low, uh, low protein and, and possibly they think they eat enough, but because of the higher satiety of uh, fat and protein, plus the, the, the faster metabolism, they actually almost like hypocaloric state. Is that possible? I don't think so. No, I, mm -hmm. I have never, I've heard a lot of conversations about that from people in, in uh, just sort of the general area of low carb as a criticism or a concern, but I don't know of any data that suggests that that's true even a little bit. If a person is getting, my worry only in, with thyroid hormone is, are you getting enough iodine? That mm -hmm. is, if you're getting enough iodine in your diet and, 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 and there's, no, there's nothing wrong with your, with your thyroid um, system to the brain uh, and back, then no, I don't believe there's any reason to be worried about thyroid hormone at all. But the iodine concern is real, especially as more and more people are eating kind of gourmet salts. You know, and I'm an advocate of, of like the Redmond Real Salt. I know those guys. I think that's a great salt. And we use that salt in my home. But as someone's eating these kind of specialty salts, these salts are not iodinated. They have not had iodine added in. And so mm -hmm. one of the very few supplements that we have in my home that I give to my children every day, I give my children typically three things. Vitamin D, even though I try to get them to play outside more, you know, kids nowadays just don't go outside as much as they used to. So we have a vitamin D, a vitamin D3 in particular, and then omega-3 fatty acids, because we don't eat a lot of fish in my home. The kid, you know, Western culture, it's just not as much sure. part of our cuisine. And then third, I give them potassium iodide. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's an iodine source. And it's just a teeny little dropper and they're eating breakfast. And I say, okay, open your mouth, drip, drip, drip 
I take one, my wife takes one. It's just a way to make sure that we have enough iodine to maintain thyroid function because thyroid hormone is so important to every tissue, especially the brain. And if you have a little child growing up and they're iodine deficient and thyroid deficient, it can have irreparable damage on, on, on brain development. And so I just make sure my kids get enough iodine. Now, if someone eats a lot of seafood, they get it. Not only do they get the omega-3, but they also get the iodine as it's enriched in the ocean in these animals. But we don't eat a lot of seafood. And because we don't eat iodinated salt, which all salt used to, you know, anyone who would buy salt at the store, certainly in, in the U.S. and in Canada, my, my native land, but I'm in the U.S. now, all the salt would be iodinated or iodinized. I don't know what they'd call it, but it added iodine to it. That is to just make sure there's enough iodine to foster thyroid um, function. So anyway, that's a huge tangent. And sorry for taking too long. No, no, that's good. Make sure, make sure people that if they start eating different types of salt, and, and that's good because the salt has other minerals in it, like the, the, the Redmond salt or, or sea salt, that's great. Eat it. But that does mean you might not be getting enough iodine. So make sure you get enough iodine. Now let's talk about a different kind of fat, which is the body fat. Yeah. And uh, as you were uh, talking about that in other places, that the, the fat tissues can have two kind of phase. One of them is uh, high, uh, hypertrophy and the other is hyperplasia, right? Yeah. And most people would think hypertrophy coming from like bodybuilding or something like that. Yeah, right. Good. Yeah. But is it for the, the fat? Yeah. Yeah. That's excellent. I like the way you, you frame that. No, it's not good in the case of a fat cell. So when a muscle cell grows, when a muscle grows, you know, if I'm getting bigger arms, it's because each cell is getting bigger. I don't have more cells. And so the cells are growing and that's called hypertrophy. They're not multiplying, which is called mm -hmm. hyperplasia. Which is still debatable. It, yeah, that, that's right. right. Yeah, and it happens in some animals. Yeah. Um, but it, uh, the evidence that that accounts for muscle growth in humans is very, very limited. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. know that hypertrophy exists. Hyperplasia may be in certain instances it can, but it certainly does not account for most muscle growth. Fat cell can grow a fat tissue. You know, if I'm getting fat, the fat around my, my neck or my belly, as that starts to grow, it can also grow through two ways. <clears throat> hypertrophy, which is where each fat cell is getting big, or it multiplies, which is hyperplasia. So it can be hypertrophic fat or mm -hmm. hyperplastic mm -hmm. fat. Hyperplastic is healthy at fat tissue. Now, that is an interesting situation that is partly based on genetics and partly based on diet, where we like the seed oils we mentioned earlier, that linoleic acid, that, that fat that you get from soybean oil, actually will stimulate, it will inhibit the multiplication of fat cells. And so it will make a fat cell grow through hypertrophy rather than hyperplasia. Hyperplasia is where someone can get really fat and stay healthy mm -hmm. metabolically. I mean, reasonably, that's not mm -hmm. healthy at all. But their insulin can be good, their glucose can be good, their blood mm -hmm. pressure can be good. And so and you there look are at those this person, people, right? Oh, absolutely. And this is typically when it's really fat and it's really jiggly. It's mm -hmm. loose fat dangling, you know, hanging down. That's a person who looks very sick. But if you look at their blood and, and blood pressure, they're okay. You know, it's not healthy, but they're better than you think. So some people can do that. And again, that's, it's partly genetics and partly diet. Most people go the other way. <clears throat> and that's where the fat cells we have, by the time we finish adolescence and become adults, you know, around 20, the number of fat cells we have is done. Our fat cells are done. We're not making, we're not multiplying them. That doesn't mean they're immortal. Fat cell, one, a fat cell will die and it will get replaced about every 10 years. So the fat cell number stays the same, but the fat cells start to grow. And that is a sick way of getting fat. As that fat cell gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it starts to become insulin resistant. It's basically telling insulin, I cannot get any bigger. You want me to keep getting bigger? I can't. I'm as big as I can get. So I'm not going to listen to you anymore. I'm not going to let you keep telling me to get big. Mm -hmm. And so this fat cell starts to leak out fat. And it starts to leak out um, inflammatory proteins called cytokines. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of person who doesn't get morbidly obese, 
they may get fat, but then they stop getting fat. You know, they, they don't just keep getting fatter and fatter and fatter, like the person who has hyperplastic growth. The hypertrophic growth, they get fat and they stop, and now they start to get very sick. They get very insulin resistant in their fat cells, and then that leaking of fat and leaking of you know, inflammatory proteins makes other tissues like the liver and the muscle and maybe even the brain become insulin resistant. And then when the liver and the muscle become insulin resistant, that's when glucose starts to climb. And then the brain, as it becomes insulin resistant, that's when they can get migraine headaches. They can get start to have dementia and, and cognitive decline, the brain not working as well. So if you wanted to be fat, you want hyperplastic fat cell. And interestingly, Peter, there's a drug that someone can take. The, uh, and actually, the way the drug works to help them with their diabetes, they take the drug and it takes the big fat cell and says, you can now multiply. And so now the fat cell will start to um, proliferate through hyperplasia. And so two things happen. They become less diabetic, but fatter. Mm -hmm. And it's because the drug is making their fat cells grow through the other way, the healthier way. So they can get fatter, but they're healthier. That's very interesting what you say. My wife is Chinese. Mm -hmm. so, so I see with them that they are really skinny. Yes. But... But the ratio of being uh, diabetic, it's, it's not better. No, Is in that... fact, yeah, that's awesome. I'm thrilled you brought that up. I did my postdoctoral studies in Singapore. Mm. And in Singapore, it's very interesting because they have a, a very distinct populations. They have the Chinese Asians, they have Indian Asians, and they have a lot of Caucasian, just Europeans. And... Uh, there's a very, very big difference in, in how fat you can get and stay healthy. So I like to joke, if you really want to be fat, you want to be European, Caucasian, because Caucasians store fat, um, they can get more fat and stay healthier. Mm -hmm. But Asians are almost on the opposite side, where an Asian starts to get a little fat, and they're sick. They have very high blood pressure, very high glucose, you know, very bad diabetes. And you look at the Asian and you think, you're just a little chubby. You know, if that Asian was a Caucasian, in, in American, if we have an American Asian or an American, a European American, you would say they're both a little chubby and the Caucasian American is fine, no problem, healthy. But the Asian American is sick. They have diabetes, they have hypertension, and that's partly at least because their fat cells grow in a bad way. Mm -hmm. Now, regarding to keto uh, and ketogenic diet, uh, where do you draw the line? So where, where do you say, because it's always debatable, like, you know, on what level or how to eat. So where do you say like somebody is in ketosis or ketogenic diet? Yeah. So if someone wants to say they're in ketosis, I say that if you are using a blood ketone meter mm -hmm. and if you're at 0.3 or higher, that to me is ketosis. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't, I mean, some people say 0.5. I don't think that matters. If it's, if it's 0.3 or above, mm -hmm. then you're in ketosis. Um, and then the level, well, so that's, that's how I define ketosis. And then what mm -hmm. the person has to eat to get there can depend a lot. You know, you're a lean fit man. You, let's say you exercise 90 minutes a day. You could probably be in ketosis with a hundred grams of carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. Someone who has less muscle mass and is more sedentary and even say insulin resistant, where the insulin is staying up higher for longer when they eat carbohydrate, they may have to be down to 20 grams in order to be at the same ketones that a more active, muscled, insulin-sensitive person is. So, so the, the actual amount of grams of carbohydrate to be in ketosis can vary quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So you, you decided to write a book. And the book is, is, as I understand, pretty close because I pre-ordered, so I can't wait to get ah, released. Well, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Uh, what made you write the book? I mean, it's, it's, it's quite painful, right? Because as oh. we know that when you finish it, then you think like, I should change this and this and add this and oh, this. But oh, it's, yeah, it's heavens, yes. Door. <clears throat> yes, you're absolutely right. Yes, yeah, so that's been a kind of a funny, interesting adventure. Yeah, so the book, anyone who wants to get it, uh, please, anywhere books are sold, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, you can get audio. Audio version will be coming soon, but you can get a, a, a Kindle version. It's, it's called Why We Get Sick, um, but it really is about insulin resistance, and I kind of break it up into a few parts where 
what is insulin resistance and why does it matter? So just defining it and helping mm -hmm. the person understand why I would devote a career to studying this. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so, so what it is, uh, why it matters, you know, what are all the diseases that come from it? Because it's shocking uh, where, where someone is, they may be taking a medication for their blood pressure, a medication for their diabetes, and maybe a medication for their migraine headaches. And they look at those as three totally different diseases. Well, they can be, but more often than not, they're actually all connected to insulin resistance. And so don't take three different medications, just fix the insulin resistance and now mm -hmm. you can address all problems. So that's the middle part. <clears throat> and then the last part is kind of the happy ending. And that is actually what to do about it. Uh, so what is insulin resistance? Why does it matter? What to do about it? And then that's a mix. I go through kind of the drugs that people take and give them kind of a grade, but then I focus a lot on lifestyle. And I'll say in the, in the book, um, it, to be uh, an objective scientist, someone can go onto a plant-based kind of vegetarian diet and improve their insulin sensitivity dramatically. Or in contrast, someone can go to a carnivore diet and improve their insulin resistance dramatically. What they have in common is that they're both avoiding processed food. If someone is avoiding processed food, their insulin sensitivity will start to immediately get better. Now, I will say though, if someone, the more someone goes plant-based and starts eschewing animal foods, the more deficient they will be in other ways. So I'm not saying that's mm -hmm. a sustainable or healthy diet, mm -hmm. but if we just look at it through the lens of insulin resistance, either of those is good as long as they are avoiding processed foods. So the book, it was an interesting process. About five years ago, maybe six years ago, I, I taught um, a, a lecture series at my university and it was not a classroom for my students. It was during the summer months, my university will sometimes uh, have like a week of professors just being able to teach classes mm -hmm. to the public. And so I thought I'm going to do this and I'm going to talk about insulin resistance for the whole week. And I called the name of this little series of my class. I called it why we get sick. And so I just kind of go through the little bits of the book almost, but I didn't have a book at the time at the end of that week. And by the end of the week, I was in a room of that can fit, I don't know, maybe 500 people and it was standing room only. It was, it was packed and I could not believe it. I was amazed that it was so popular and so many people would come up and ask, where can I buy your book? Where can I buy your book? And so I thought I should write a book <laughs> if, if enough people care about this. And so then I started writing the book and the book took about one year for me to write. But then Peter, I was so naive. I had to find a book agent mm -hmm. and that took, I don't know, uh, probably eight months to find an agent. It was so painful. And once I had an agent, she had to help it, us find a publisher, someone who would actually buy the book and publish it. And that took another probably year. And then once we had the publisher, then it took a year to edit the book. You know, now that that's all done, now the book will be released in July but it, like you say, it's available for pre-order now, but oh my goodness, it's just so, so long. And now even though now I, I was looking at through the book, the advanced copy that I got just to look at it and I would see the way I wrote something and just think, oh, why did I write it that way? I should have, I should have changed it. So I hope that the book sells well enough that we can do a second edition and then I'll change what I want to change. Or you can update the new research. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. So, um, Personally, were you always, uh, let's say, low carb and high fat, or, or as a scientist, when you when you started to see the proof, you you started to kind of shift to that direction. Oh yeah, that's right. That's that's right. Mm. I was not always low carb, not at all. So w during my master's degree, uh, about eighteen years ago, I, is that that long ago? Yeah, yeah, about twenty years ago, I, um, eighteen years ago, I was. I was a personal trainer. I worked in a gym as a trainer. I got certified as a trainer. And just like everyone, I would say, oh, no, you have to eat less calories, eat less fat. And I remember people asking me, well, hey, what do you think about this Atkins diet? And I didn't know anything, but I pretended like I did. I pretended I knew. And so I would say, sure, you'll lose weight, but you'll die from heart disease. So don't do it. It's crazy. It's a crazy way to do it. And I really thought that. 
But I didn't know any evidence on that. I didn't know any at all. And then during my, during my PhD, we were doing a study where we were injecting um, rats with insulin. And even though they were eating the same amount as the other group, they were getting fatter. Mm. And I thought, this is impossible. It's impossible. The, the laws of physics, the thermodynamics, this can't be possible. But humans, we are not these closed systems when it comes to physics and energy and calories. That, that doesn't, I don't think that's fair to apply to humans. And, and, and we're, we're more complicated than that. Namely, we have hormones that we have to consider and account for. So that was the beginning, and this was, this was uh, 2008. That was the beginning of me starting to think that I might be wrong. And then in 2011, right when I was a brand new professor at BYU, someone suggested that I read a book called Good Calories, Bad Calories by Gary Tobbs. Mm-hmm. I read that book and I said, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to feel afraid of saying that there's more to obesity than just calories in, calories out. That was, Gary's book was just, I thought was so good. If, if someone listening hasn't read that book, before you read my book, read Gary's book, Good Calories, Bad Calories. It is exquisitely well done. And that was the, that was the beginning of me like I said, stopping feeling, uh, wondering, I said, no, I'm going to start looking at this more. And the more I was understanding how bad elevated insulin can be, it all just fit. It all fit. If, if, and then I started looking at the studies. If, if I want to lower my insulin, how, what's the best way to do that? And sure enough, the best way is re- avoiding carbohydrates. And then, well, then what about weight loss? And if you look at all of the studies published, that look uh, that have tried to clamp calories, low carb versus high carb. Mm. The low carb diet will win pretty much every time, and the low the low fat diet wins never uh, in that case. So that was the just looking at the data, the published human clinical yes. evidence. That was the beginning of me saying, I, I, "I'm, I'm, I, everything I thought I knew about this was wrong," and I had to be humble enough to admit it. And then in my own life now, as I'm in my you know mid forties. I will say a low carb diet is an effortless way to stay lean. Um, it is effort. You don't have to be hungry. You don't have to count calories. You just simply eat less carbs, which is not always so easy because that tends to be very addictive things. You know, for me, I love tortilla chips. I love tortilla chips um, and who, that's who the biggest one? temptation. Yeah, that's right. So anyway, uh, that, that's my evolution. That's my journey but, of but, appreciating the relevance of insulin in disease and then admitting that the best way to control insulin is to control carbohydrates. But, but okay, so if you as a per- private person uh, understands that and change the opinion, that's one thing, but you as a scientist, that's a different thing. So as a, as a professional, uh, probably you are not uh, surrounded by other scientists who are oh, sharing no. this opinion. I'm trying to be very polite here. Yeah, yeah, so, no, I'm not. In fact, there have been people that have gone through the university um, here, like actual professors at my university that have tried to have the university muzzle me. They've tried to force the university to stop me Mm -hmm. from teaching what I teach. Because when I'm showing my students data about in my class that I teach, I'm showing them about diabetes. And I'll say, this is the way to treat diabetes. You can give them insulin therapy. Mm -hmm. Oh, but let's look what happens when you increase their insulin even more. They get fatter and sicker and they die more. So what if we lower insulin? Oh, things start to get better. And then I just say, well, what's the best way to lower insulin? And we look only at the data. It is never just Professor Bickman telling them, no, I up on the screen will show study, study, another study, another study, another study. I just look at the data. So when these other professors say Dr. Bickman is teaching against science, my reply is, no, here are 20 studies prove me wrong or don't complain anymore. That's my reply. Prove me wrong. Show me the data. And then I will, I will teach that. But if the data support this, I'm showing the data, only the data, not my opinion. Is is that true? You just had a smaller research project when you were uh, having collected a few 
uh, diabetic women, like freshly diagnosed diabetic women. And after a couple of weeks, as I believe, they were not showing any more the sign of diabetes. Yeah, yeah, that's a case study that we published a few yeah. months ago. We took 11 women, middle-aged women, newly diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, and within 90 days of a ketogenic diet, with just weekly coaching, that was it. Just once a week, they'd come check in mm -hmm. at this little clinic. The diabetes was gone. No marker. They lost weight. Their blood pressure went down. Their glucose levels dropped mm -hmm. to normal levels. Just 90 so, days. So, so then nobody said like, well, Dr. Beekman, this is not a, an RCT. This is, it was, <laughs> it was not double blind placebo. Uh, it's small sample. Yeah, and it was. All of those are fair criticisms. Absolutely. Um, I just don't have the means to do randomized controlled trials sure. like like my friend David Ludwig um, could do. You know, there are those are bigger labs with with hundreds, thousands of times more funding than I have here, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So we could only do this as a clinical case by working with some doctors in my city. But it's because there are doctors who have tried this and seen how effective it is that they they can't unsee it. Mm -hmm. That they, they have a diabetic who comes in and they say, okay, you have two old choices. You can keep eating the way you're eating now and I will give you uh, medications and you'll have to take these medications forever or you can change the way you eat and we don't need medications. And sometimes people want medications. They will pick the easy way and other times they'll say, no, I want to be healthier. I don't want drugs. I'm going to pick the hard way, which is changing habits. Mm -hmm. It is not easy to change habits, but when they do, it works. So I, I think anybody who listen this podcast will say that you, you have you are very enthusiastic. That's no yeah. question about that. So what drives you? Yeah, well, it is this idea of um, wanting to share the answers. So as a scientist, it is a wonderful job. I love it. I get paid to be curious. That is a scientist's job. And so I'm not teaching right now in the summer. And so I come into my office, my lab is just across the hallway. I can spend a whole day just asking myself questions and then finding the answers to those questions. And if I can't find the answer, then I say, can I answer the question in my lab? And then we, if we can, then we try to find the answer. That is a wonderful job. It doesn't pay very well, but it's a wonderful job. Um, so I enjoy that part. But when you have answers to these important questions, like why do we get sick? You know, what is behind most chronic diseases? Mm -hmm. Why do we have diabetes and hypertension and Alzheimer's so high when, when three generations ago we had almost none? Why is it so common? When you start to find the answer to that, you want to share it with other people. You know, I want to stand up on the buildings and shout, why are we getting sick? I want to tell everyone. And that, that has been the, the, the motivation for my book, the motivation for all of my involvement on social media. It is, it is to just share research, to share the science. And that's why I'm enthusiastic, I guess, because if you think you have the answer to a very important question, you just want to share the answer. Well, I think this is the best end point. Uh, so I really appreciate your time. And uh, I personally learn a lot too. Great. So I hope the same gonna happen with the, the viewers and listeners. So again, I really thankful for uh, accepting my invitation and uh, God bless you and uh, just all the best in life. Thank you, Peter. It was my pleasure. This was great. Yeah, I hope, I hope everyone finds this useful. Thank you. Thank you, sir.